Today, we're going to be looking at an H-top replacement known as Bash Top. Now, why might you want to use something like this? Well, let's say that you're looking at H-top and you realize, I want something that isn't mainly a process monitor. So if you look at HTOP, as you can see, there's lots of processy stuff, but let's say instead of this, you wanted something that was mainly a system monitor first. Well, in HTOP, you really only get stuff about your CPU, a bit of memory, and that's, that's basically all you get. But when it comes to a system monitor, there's a lot more that you might want to see, like your network usage, your GPU usage, a bunch of other things like that. So that's where something like Bashtop actually comes in. So as you can see here, we have our disk usage, we have individual CPU usages, and then like a bar showing us how much we're actually using. We have our network usage, and we also have process monitoring as well. So Bash Top is kind of the reverse of HTOP. HTOP is a process monitor first and a system monitor second. And Bash Top is a system monitor first and a process monitor second. So if that's something that you might want to use, then maybe checking out Bash Top would actually be pretty useful. So as we can see, Bash Top is broken down into five sections. We have the CPU section, we have the memory section, we have the disk section, we have the net section, and the process section. So under the CPU section, as you can see, we have the individual core breakdown. Now, you might also notice, I'll zoom in on just a bit so you can see a bit better. You might also notice that my CPU temps look a little bit weird. So every single one of my cores has the exact same temperature. Now, in reality, this wouldn't actually be the case because as you can see, some of them are at like 12% usage, some are at 32% usage. Obviously, they will actually have different temperatures. This is sort of a problem with the way that the API with interacting with AMD CPUs works on Linux. So this isn't a problem with the application. This is just a problem with AMD CPUs on Linux. If you're on an Intel CPU, each of your individual cores should actually have individual temperatures. Now, off to the left here, we basically have a bar of performance. So if I was to say start up a hardware test right now or a, a hardware stress test basically you're going to start seeing a bunch of spikes in here now i don't actually have one installed but you kind of get the point as the cpu usage goes up basically you'll see more activity over here and then we have a bar across the top here that basically shows you the total of the actual cpu being used which is always nice to see now off to the side here we have our memory usage and one thing you might notice in here i don't know how well it's showing up on camera all of these bars are gradients. So look at this point, look at this point. You can see that the color is actually changing. So one thing to keep in mind is if you do want to use Bash Top, you have to be using a true color terminal. I'll show you what it looks like in URXVT afterwards, but if you want to use Bash Top, it has to be a true color terminal. Now I've done a video on true color terminals, but I would recommend something like Kitty, Alacrity, or ST. Those are all pretty good choices. So in the memory section, we have the used memory. So currently I'm using 3.37 gigs. I have the available, I have the cached and the free. And then under that, I have my swap. Now, it seems like 100% of my swap is free because yeah, I'm actually not using any of it right now. So all 48 gigabytes of my swap is free. I've talked about why I have 48 gigs of swap. Not gonna do that today. It's, uh, there's, there's reasons for it. They're not very good reasons, but there's reasons. Anyway, next to that, we have the disk usage. And this is something you don't actually get to see over in HTOP. As you can see, we have a bit of memory information, but there's nothing about our disks over here. But over in Bash Top, as you can see, we have to give it a second to resize because it is written in Bash, which means it will be a little bit slow from time to time. That's really the only problem with it. But over here, we have our root disk usage, which is my NVMe drive, and also my home disk usage, which is my two terabyte hard drive. And then below that, we have the network usage. So the network usage works in a very similar way to the bar for the CPU usage. As you do more network stuff, the bar obviously increases. Less network stuff, the bar decreases. And then you have some information about, you know, how much you're downloading and how much you're uploading. And then to the right here, we have our process management. Now... One thing you might have noticed is that above all of the windows up here, there are little gray letters or there's little gray symbols. So those actually show you what the key bindings are. And that is really, really useful to see. So if I want to say, I don't know, filter my processes, I can just press F and that will then actually bring up the filter. So let's just bring up all the processes related to library. 
And as you can see, that brings up all those processes. And if I press enter, then that takes me back into the list where I can select stuff. And you can scroll through this list by using your arrow keys. Sadly, you can't do it with Vim keys. So let's say we want to go down to this one right here. And we want to actually look at some information about it. So if I go and press enter on that, that will then bring up some extra information to tell you how much CPU it's using, how much memory it's using, and a couple of other things about it as well. How many threads it's got, what its parent is, who the user that started is, whether it's running, how long it's been running for, just basic stuff about a process. So if we want to go back, as you can see up the top here, it says we can close it, but we can also do a couple of other things as well. So we can terminate it, kill it, or interrupt it. Now, if you're not really sure what that means, basically this means send the sig term signal, this means send sig kill, and this means send a sig int. Now this is one of the problems if you compare it to htop for example. So in htop, you can actually go and just send an arbitrary signal to basically any process. So let's say we wanted to, I don't know, run a signal on this Alacrity instance. If I just go and press F9 on this, as you can see, I can basically send literally any signal that's available. So I can send sig int here, sig kill or sig term, but I can go and send other ones like say, I don't know, sig stop, or I can send something like, uh, I'm not gonna try to say that, I can send signal 35, or I can send, you know, any of the other signals in here. So because bash top is mainly a system monitor first, it does miss out on some of the benefits you do get from a application that is mainly a process monitor, but I don't think that's really that big of a deal. Most of the time, if you do need to do any process monitoring, it's probably going to be actually killing the process. Most of the time, you don't need to send like signal 42 to something. If you want to do that, you can always go and do that with something like kill, for example. So if you look around the screen, you can probably see some of the extra bindings this application has. So for example, we have the reverse binding and what reverse is going to do is reverse the ordering of the process list. So right now it's being ordered from memory greatest to lowest. If we reverse that, that is now memory lowest to greatest. We can also switch this into tree mode. And what tree mode is going to do is basically let you see which processes start which other processes. So right now it's reversed, but we can switch that back to regular sorting. And right now systemd is at the top. So systemd started OBS and OBS started OBS-FFmpeg-MUX. Systemd also started Alacrity and that started ZSH and that started HTOP. So as you can see, basically it gives you an idea of what applications or I guess more specifically what processes started what other processes. So we can also switch the ordering that we have here. So right now it's ordering by memory, but we can also order by CPU lazy, CPU responsive, PID, which is this ID off to the side here. And if we reverse this ordering right now, as you're going to see, system D is now at the top because system D has the process ID one. We can also order by the program name. So in this case, Bracket is at the top because bracket, it comes before capitals and capitals come before lowercase. Now, I would have thought that capitals and symbols come after lowercase characters, but I guess I'm wrong about that. We can also sort by the argument. So that is this tab right here. And we can sort by the number of threads. And as you can see, OBS is at the top because OBS is using 66 threads. And then we also have the user sorting. And as you can see, my name is at the top because my name starts before things like root and also system D plus. And then if we click again, that will then take us back to the memory. And that was being done just with the arrow key. So as you can see, there's little direction symbols here that basically just means, you know, arrow keys. Okay. We also have bindings for changing the update time of the application. So up the top here, you can probably see it. there's a plus and a minus, and there's a 2000 milliseconds. So what that means is every 2000 milliseconds, the application will update, but we don't have to have it that slow. We can also go and, you know, reduce that. So let's take it down to like 500 milliseconds. So this means that every half a second, the application is going to update. So everything is now moving much quicker. And obviously if we go in the other direction, we can then slow it way down. We can set it to like four seconds or something like that. And that means that every four seconds, the application will now update. Now I'll take it back down to 2000 just because that's a reasonable number to have. I think by default, it might be at 2500, but I can't exactly remember. 
We can also go and switch through our network devices by just pressing B and N for back and next, I presume. So if we press B, as you can see, that takes us to this device. B again, it takes us to the loopback device and then B again, and it takes us to my main device. Or we can also go in the other direction as well by pressing N, basically the same idea. Now, the other binding that is really important is the M binding. So if I go and press M now, it basically brings up a little menu that reminds me of some like classic games. Now, there's a couple of things in here, like for example, the options, and the options in here basically will let you configure everything that can be configured in the configuration file. So you don't actually have to go and modify the config file. You can do all of the configuration inside of the application, which is always really, really cool to see. Now, by default, when you go and download this application, it won't actually come with any themes. But as you can see, if you go and press enter on this, it will go download all of the default themes. So I'm running flat remix right now, but I'll show you what it looks like by default. Not that one, this one right here. So this is how it looks by default. It doesn't look bad. It looks pretty good actually, but I prefer the flat remix theme. So if I go back into that menu and then go and switch that back to flat remix, actually I'll show you some of the other ones. So we have things like grayscale, which obviously is gonna be in grayscale. Uh, Grovebox, if you like Grovebox stuff, I, I have never liked Grovebox, but there is a Grovebox theme for this by default. So if you do wanna use that, then be my guest. I'm not gonna use it myself just cause I think Grovebox looks really, really ugly. But we also have things like Monokai as well, which if you like Monokai, it's Monokai. So yeah. Anyway, I'm not gonna go through any more themes. You kind of get the idea of what a theme is, but we can also go and update things like the update timer that we were updating just before. So right now, as you can see, 2000 milliseconds, but we can, you know, reduce this as well. So set this down to a thousand. And if you're noticing up the top here, it's also changing the number as we're actually modifying this as well, which is always cool to see. And there's a bunch of other things you can configure as well. One thing that might be nice is if the name of your CPU is being picked up weirdly, you can go and specify a custom name for it. So right now I'm just letting it use the default name because I've got an empty string here, but I could set this to say, you know, Ryzen, spell that correctly, Ryzen CPU. And now as you can see, the name of it is no longer the actual name of the processor. It is now just called Ryzen CPU personally. I've never had a problem getting the CPU name detected, but if that is a problem for you, then you can always do that. And there's other things in here as well, like disabling the gradients inside the application, setting whether the processes are reversed, basically all the stuff you can configure with key bindings or can configure in the config file can be done from this menu with the exception of the key bindings. Now, speaking of the key bindings, if we just go over to that menu, there's a quicker way to get there is by pressing H and the quicker way to get to the options menu is by pressing O, just an easier way to move around the application. Speaking of the key bindings, basically all of the key bindings in here are alternative bindings to other bindings already in the application. So for example, if you want to go and raise the update timer, that can be done with plus and it can also be done with A or capital A. We can also lower it by pressing minus capital S or lowercase s. The only binding that doesn't have an alt binding is enter. Now I might've mentioned that you can go and configure the bindings in the config file. Now I was wrong about that. You can't actually go and configure the bindings, but you can go and modify the config file to do other stuff. So if we go and have a look at that, so if we go into LF and go into my .config directory, into the bash top directory, this is where the themes are gonna be located. The themes, if we have a look at that for just a moment, are pretty straightforward. My recommendation is if you wanna make a custom theme, go and download the default themes, go and look at what they're actually doing in here, and then basically go and write one from one of those. It's gonna be easier than starting completely from scratch. So that's how the themes look, but if we go into the bashtop.cfg, as you can see, basically all of the configuration for this is exactly the same as you would do inside of the application. So if we wanna say, I don't know, set process reversed, we can go and set this from being false to true. We can set the sorting from being memory to something else. We can set, I don't know, process per core. The only thing that makes it worse to edit this instead of doing it in the application is that in the application, some of these things like I don't know, the memory, for example, the memory will autofill with the correct answers. Whereas if you're doing it in your editor, you don't exactly get that. So to end off the video, I guess I can show you what it looks like if we open it in a terminal that isn't a true color terminal. Now ignore the fact that my fonts are kind of broken. 
They're better than they used to be, but they're still kind of broken. If I go and open up Bash Top, the coloring looks a little bit weird, and it's just all bizarre looking. And that's because your XVT doesn't actually have true color support. So if you're using a terminal that doesn't have true color support, you cannot use Bash Top. I guess you can technically use it if you want to deal with whatever is going on here, but it's not going to look the way that it's supposed to look. So I would highly recommend using a true color terminal if you do want to use it, but if you can accept this weird behavior, I guess do whatever you want, I guess. Now, the last thing to mention is how to actually get it installed. Now, it's pretty simple being mainly a Bash application. So if you're on OS X, there are a couple of dependencies that you do need to download, and you can probably see that this is where some of the extra stuff comes in. So it's mainly a Bash application, but there is some Python dependencies. So on OS X, you'll have to go and download those like that. But on Linux, it's a little bit easier. You can do the manual installation through this method, or you can do the AUR method or the Debian based method as well. And the only reason that you need to do that, or the only reason that you should do that is because there are some Python dependencies. If it was just a bash script, then you could just go and download the bash script and just put it into your script repo or put it into like your slash user slash bin. But because there are some Python dependencies, there are a couple of extra things that you need to download as well. So come check out the GitHub page if you're not really sure how to get it installed, but it should be pretty straightforward. Now, I think that's pretty much everything for me. So I am actually a really big fan of Bash Top. I've been using it pretty frequently recently. I still use HTOP from time to time just for dealing with some process stuff when I'm too lazy to run kill to do like signal 42 or whatever it is. Sometimes I still do use HTOP, but I should be able to pretty much just switch over to Bash Top. It's pretty much just a drop-in replacement. I don't do a ton of process management inside of HTOP, so I'm not really losing out on much. And having that extra system monitory stuff is actually kind of useful to have as well. So I'm probably gonna keep using this, and if you think it's cool, go check it out for yourself and see if it's something that you want to use on your system. So I think that's everything for me, but before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to Joachim, Corbinian, Craig, Nathan, Andrew, Montezai, Joseph, Peter D. Rode, Tony, Donald, John, Mikkel, Spagin, Thais, and Zilva. I'm thinking about moving the $2 patrons into like the thing DT does where he just has a big list of them, but right now I'm going to keep listing them out. So also remember to go check out my podcast that is Tech of a T available on Library, BitTube, BitChute, and a bunch... It's not on BitChute. No, it's not on BitChute either. It's on Library and YouTube, and the audio version is available wherever you listen to audio podcasts. Also, remember to check out this channel on Library, BitChute, BitChute, and other platforms as well. And yeah, go check out my blog, which I still haven't updated in a while, and go support the Amazon affiliate links. If you want to, you know, support the channel without paying any money, the Amazon affiliate link is the easiest way to do that. You can just buy stuff on Amazon, and it doesn't cost you anything extra, and I get a bit of kickback from that. So I think that's pretty much everything for me, and I'm out. <laughs>